Hi, hi everybody again, uh, Revan Stock. Today with uh, Noel Salazar, which is uh, anthropologist, professor at uh, Liberty University, an author of uh, interesting books like uh, Momentos Mobilities, which is uh, not just a theory of mobility, but it's also a personal experience of himself moving. And a number of uh, articles that we, we have uh, in the website suggested as a interesting readings for all of you. Uh, I was just reading, uh, reading yesterday, theorizing mobility through concepts and figures, which is a, a really uh, deep uh, reflection on these issues. So hi, Noel, thanks for being with us today here. Thank you for the invitation. And I look forward to uh, continuing reflecting here on issues related to mobility. <laughs> Great. Um, we, we have been uh, producing from the from all talks we had before a number of what we call claims, claims. So hypothesis, actually, hypothesis. I would like to contrast with with you, and I would like to know what you think about the first. The first is about uh, about our. I don't know if our understanding, our our wish or to what extent this is true, that we are um, witnessing a cultural change in mobility in Europe, but not only on, in Europe, but particularly in Europe. So we, we begin to understand, to be sure that mobility is not just a matter of providing useful services to people, but also mobility is an experience. People are living at the same time they are moving. Therefore, it has a meaning for, for people. Do, do you think that this transformation from transport to mobility is something that is common, commonplace, that is becoming dominant, or is just restricted to an uh, intellectual elite and some advanced politicians? So you start already immediately with uh, quite a, a complicated question that I, I need to unpack, uh, and it's important. So you talk about cultural change in mobility in Europe. And so Europe, that's nice because it's, it, it already limits it. It's not the whole world, it's, it's Europe. Uh, cultural change in mobility, then we need to, of course, explain what we mean by, by those terms. And in my own work, uh, when I use the term mobility, I always explain uh, what I understand. And I actually, I think it's very important and that whenever we are talking about mobility, that we ask people to clarify what they are actually talking about because mobility is, is a, a word that is used in many different contexts and can have uh, quite a number of, of meanings. Just to give you an example, uh, even, even within Europe and within the EU, uh, there are particular frameworks uh, like mobility is often used also in, in, in contrast with migration. Uh, and so, so these are all different terms that uh, that have connotations and it's important to to realize uh, what these connotations are uh, what is important and i do this exercise actually because i teach also about mobility and i ask my students in my, my first class i actually uh, do things the opposite way i start with an exam and so I, I i tell them to do a free association exercise and so i give them the word mobility and they have to associate words that they link to it. And so this is actually very interesting because then, then you see that uh, most of us, when we think about mobility, we have rather positive associations. So it seems to be a, a positive uh, type of word. And so it means or, uh, very clearly, it's, it's not a, a value neutral word. I think transport as a term would be much more value neut neutral than mobility. Mobility has all kinds of uh, values associated to it and in most cases for most people these values are positive uh, it's linked among others also to to uh, change this there seems to be a very interesting link uh, between mobility and change and why is mobility such a popular word i mean we use it in academia we use it among policymakers. also also increasingly in the media we hear about mobility uh, because it's 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 related to certain values. There's an, there's a certain linkage with uh, the fact that people are being able to move, and that's so. So there's an idea of freedom associated with it. So so that's a positive value. Uh, so that it is also easy. Uh, 
And of course, there is there is an, an important distinction that I, among other scholars, make. Uh, when we're talking about movement and about mobility, we're talking about different things. Uh, because mobility really has this this meanings that are attached to movement and so it's it's how we basically make movements meaningful that make it mobility so uh movement is is more an, an abstract uh physical term like the physical act of, of movement and mobility can go in in much more directions we also talk about virtual um, mobilities uh, but when of course when we apply that to to transport uh what is very important is to make the distinction when we're talking about transport, it's mostly uh, people who are being moved. Uh, most of what transport means, not all of them, but most of what transport means and also how transport as a field was developed was actually moving people around. Uh, and this is of course a very modern idea because in the pre-modern times, uh, people had to move, had to put a lot of effort into into moving uh, because you know they had to they had to walk uh, you know they had to go on 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 horseback so it was all a bit uh, more difficult and it required quite a bit of energy and then transport is this idea of course uh, with new technologies that you can actually have machines that actually uh, move people around so it takes it takes away uh, quite a bit of the energy and it also makes uh, traveling around more comfortable. And so it makes it all, all uh, nice um, and also, of course, uh, quicker uh, because technologies allow us to go quicker. Uh, but what, what is now being revealed, and I think the, the COVID-19 crisis uh, made this even stronger, is that by uh, moving or changing from uh, people who are moving to people who are being moved in, in a passive way, so. Uh, cars who bring people or, or buses or trains or planes who, who move people around uh, that something something has been lost uh, and what has been lost is, is of course uh, people who, who are uh, self who are engaging in self-propelled movements or people who are uh, moving themselves around and this bodily uh, activity also in the moving around and it's very interesting how in in a lot of urban context, uh, you see many people who are, uh, when the infrastructure allows it, are, are making these efforts to going back to biking, walking, to actually uh, going back to these uh, more active forms of movement. And this, of course, this already existed. Uh, people were doing this already in their free time, in the leisure time. But now you see that more and more also people are trying to do this in like the, the work to home uh, uh, mobilities, this, this uh, going back uh, to actually these more active forms of movement, which shows that, uh, and, and this is of course what many sciences have, have proven that uh, moving or the act of being in motion is of course very important to living beings, not just to humans, to animals, to, I mean, uh, our world is actually always in motion. And so people too have to be in motion. And so transport in, in that sense is, is a rather unnatural thing because you are being moved, but you are not yourself doing the, the effort. And sometimes you don't even notice or you barely notice that, that you are moving. Uh, and so this is definitely uh, one, one change uh, that you can see that is uh, going on uh, in terms of movement. But of course, as I said, uh, if there are changes uh, and if there are uh, people interested in making changes because they feel certain needs, uh, then the, uh, there are, of course, and I mentioned infrastructure. Of course, there needs to be a structure and an infrastructure that actually allows this to be possible. Uh, when I'm talking about, about biking, uh, there's a lot of people who have an interest in, in biking, but of course you would need uh, adequate infrastructure to actually allow that. Uh, and this is just, just, just one example, but this idea of, of, of uh, recognizing that uh, being actively in motion is actually something what people also uh, need. And, and actually this is, this is what we clearly saw also during uh, the lockdowns, you know, the, the lockdowns uh, when the coronavirus crisis started, 
that in many countries people were not allowed to do many things, but uh, they were allowed, like in Belgium where I live, people were allowed to, to walk, to cycle and to run. And you see that people massively also did that. And, and that many people were also rediscovering how good it is to actually uh, engage in these active forms of movement, how good it is to your body and to your mental health. And so um, to a certain extent, uh, maybe the lockdowns have been a blessing in, in disguise for making people aware of, of, certain, of certain things. Now, whether we, we should or could call that a cultural change, that's of course open for debate. And if there are uh, processes of change, then of course uh, these processes of change may have started, but they are ongoing. I mean, it's, it's definitely not something, something that is finished, but cultural change would of course indicate that it's uh, a wider group of, of people that is uh, willing or open to do certain things. And then, of course, as an anthropologist, I always have to point out that it is very important to uh, be aware of, of the huge differences and inequalities within societies. Uh, because, of course, what people do and how people do things is, is, uh, is very much also determined by where they are positioned in society. Uh, and this is influenced by their social class, by their education, by their gender, by their race. I mean, there's all these parameters that basically also influence uh, what is possible and, and, and what is not possible. Mm -hmm. So I understand active mobility is a signal or is a consequence or is part of the cultural change in a way we are uh, witnessing today. Let me ask you about other other elements which we, we see that, that, that maybe are new or relatively new, like the slow movement uh, on, the, on the media, like the, the slow food movement, you know, by, by Carlo Petrini, or the traffic calm movement, the traffic calm and the environmental songs that were advocated by Jane Jacobs uh, in the 60s, or even uh, popular songs that that, that are, are telling us the importance of not running uh, as fast as possible without knowing where we are going. Plenty of songs uh, like, like this, or uh, you know, books, uh, novels like The Slowness by Milan Kundera. So that, do you see that they are around this kind of ideas becoming more present in, in the way we, we think, in the way we feel, in the way we live, or is just our wish? That this is happening. Yeah, so so speed is an is an is a concept that became very important in the in the modern era, and it's of course linked to processes of industrialization, and together with that efficiency. So so becoming more efficient also means that you do things quicker, and so that also involves transport. Uh, so so doing things uh, quicker, and of course, uh, I actually recently co-published a book with with a canadian uh, colleague of mine which we called pacing mobilities where we actually unpack uh, and we reflect upon uh, the importance of of pace uh, because when we're talking about speed uh, it's very important also to put that next to the concept of pace and maybe a concept that will ring a bell to many people is this idea of pace of life uh, because Many people are reacting towards ideas of speed uh, because there is a certain pace of life that they feel is being disturbed when things are too quick, but also too slow. I mean, too slow is of course also a, a possibility. So it's very interesting that there seems to be a pace in which we do things. Uh, and so this can go from, from walking. When you are walking uh, on the street with, with other people, uh, sometimes you may not feel at ease because it's not like your pace. So the group is walking slower than your own pace or, or quicker than your own pace. So, so there's something about a certain, a certain feeling that we have with pace. And we also we, we have that with many processes that are happening around us, uh, that it, it feels unnatural. Uh, and of course, when we are talking about active forms of mobility, this is related to, to heart rate and it's related to uh, breathing and it's related to all things that are, or our body immediately feels but also in a more abstract uh, mental and psychological way. The same kind of ideas apply when people are working and are, are, are being uh, 
also now uh, the use of technologies, modern technologies, and this constant uh, beeps on their phones and, and devices, and, and it's creating this feeling that things are happening too quick, and, and our brain has not enough time to actually process this. And so, and so there are all these all this reactions against speed. Uh, and then, of course, there are these movements to do things uh, slower. And so you have a lot of slow movements. And so you mentioned, mentioned a couple of them. Uh, but I think it's important to point out that, and this is very interesting how historically we have witnessed a change. So before the modern area and before processes of, of uh, uh, mechanization and industrialization, things were, were much slower. And so a lot of processes have been invented to speed up things. And so uh, speed, speed was actually, speed was a luxury. So the people that had had access to these technologies, they could benefit. And this was seen as this is the good thing now. And now we are uh, actually moving into a new phase where actually uh, speed is being criticized more and more and in, in, in many different domains of life. And actually, uh, there is uh, there is even sometimes an, an, a nostalgic feeling of slowness and going back often to imagined uh, slowness of how it must have been before. Uh, and sometimes it is imagined. Sometimes it's not. It's not. Uh, it wasn't like that. But people tend to tend to have it, these imaginaries. And it's uh, what is interesting here is that uh, I always say that slowness now is a luxury. Uh, there's there's a lot of people who would maybe like to be slower, uh, but that they don't have the resources to do that. Uh, and so you see that if now people engage in slowness, many people are limited to engage in slowness during their free time, because that's the time that they can control, and there they can decide to do things slower. So that's why you have slow tourism and slow food, and you know and all those things. And in many cases, happens during the free time of people. It's much harder to imply these ideas of slowness in work life because many people are not allowed to be slower. I mean, think of think of all the lorry drivers now that have to have to deliver all our packages that we order online. Uh, they maybe would also like to be slower, and maybe many of these people would also like to uh, to, to to do this thing while while biking and and and, and you know enjoying things a bit more. But they are just not allowed because you know they're on this very strict time time schedules, and so uh, to a certain extent, it is uh, in many uh, parts it's it's still wishful thinking. Uh, it's very hard to implement in 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 mm -hmm. the the world outside of the recreational. Yeah, no, I would like you to elaborate a little bit more on your concepts of staying attached to belonging and identity. And, and moving related to becoming, which seems uh, seems to me a really a really profound and, and meaningful way of understanding what you also call mobilities and immobilities. May, may you further elaborate on these concepts, please? Yeah, these are uh, difficult concepts. They are philosophical concepts that we need to unpack and of course in this context mobility and immobility can also be used in a very metaphorical way uh, it's very interesting how uh, mobility is of course a metaphor that is used to describe our life uh, many people describe also their lives as if it were a journey and so life life it, in and of itself is is associated with uh with the journey and so and so this is all about mobility and so if you do that and of course immobility which is the opposite is is the negative opposite so uh the the extreme form is the the most extreme form of immobility in life is of course when you die then you, then you become totally immobile uh, but of course everything that is immobile has a negative connotation to it also think about people who are uh uh, disabled and so who are limited in their mobility so so this is of course mostly seen as a very negative thing uh, because mobility is 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 uh, often uh, is almost always in this binary scene as the good thing and immobility than than the bad thing what is very interesting is that uh again covid 19 has has made us reflect on that uh because 
when we were in this period of lockdown, then immobility or the, the fact that many people were limited in their uh, movements was also to a certain extent a positive thing because it protected you. The people who had the luxury to be in lockdown and to stay in, in the safety of their homes, that was a luxury. And they could only do that because there was another part of society who was forced to be very mobile. And again, to make sure that society kept on functioning and made it possible for all these other people to stay actually in, in the comfort of, of their homes. Uh, now, uh, linking that with ideas of, of belonging and, and becoming, uh, these are of course, these are huge, uh, philosophical terms and and i mean you could spend uh, hours talking talking about this but when you link that to to mobility uh, it's it's very interesting and it's it's probably also linked to to the idea and the growth of of the nation state when the, when the world was developing in in a world of nation states uh, then these nation states had of course to uh distinguish themselves from neighboring nation states and so uh the idea one of the the ways that that this was being done is by stressing a lot uh the idea of belonging and belonging to a nation state because there's many forms of belonging uh but belonging to to a nation state uh is is actually a very strong one uh and and this is a scale that right now is influencing actually a lot and, and a lot of the policies are, are of course national policies uh, even if within the eu uh, things are some of things are moving to the eu level but a lot of the decisions are, are still taking at, at the national level uh, and then becoming is uh, is an idea of course of transgressing borders and so one of these borders can of course be a national or a nation state border uh, and becoming is also, again, if you think of the life metaphor, we are in the process of becoming and, and we constantly evolve. We are a baby, we become a toddler, you know, and become a child, adolescent, and, and then we are in the process of becoming. But we also have that in terms of the projects that we have with our life. Uh, we want to become and we want to have the freedom to choose what we want to become. And so migration is, of course, a part of that kind of element, uh, migration, but also uh, tourism uh, is also. I mean, a, a lot of a lot of mobilities or a lot of uh, meanings that are attached to movements have to do with ideas of of becoming. We are doing certain things because uh, we are hoping that what we are doing and these mobilities in which we are engaging will help us to grow in something. Because becoming is again, this is a very positive term and it's uh, associated with positive ideas and so the hope is that a lot of mobilities in which people are engaging uh, like migration like tourism like exchange students like people who go abroad for for a, a, a work experience that all of these mobilities uh, will have a positive uh, outcome and the positive outcome can be economic uh, earning more money uh, it can be uh, social earning earning uh, respect in your circles and and also on your social media platforms uh and also cultural in terms of uh, becoming more open-minded becoming more of a cosmopolitan be, becoming more more open uh, and so so th that's why a lot of people are engaging in this uh, boundary crossing mobilities with with the hope that it will it will help them to become something that they are actually envisioning and so that can of course be uh, filled in in many different ways okay no, no you have been presenting the positive side of of becoming let me ask you about the negative side of becoming in the sense that maybe by excessive uh, mobility by moving too much but getting too much data but no information of knowledge by a lot of communication without community, let's say by, by moving all around, all around as efficient and fast as possible, maybe we are becoming the same. Maybe we're going to the same place to do the same things, uh, same clothes with the same stress. And at the end, uh, and at the end let's say we, we, we are becoming a standard beings. There is a cultural standardization 
which has attached attached to excessive mobility. This is true that that excessive mobility can 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 uh, make us to become, uh, let's say, standardized. Well, when you talk about excessive mobility, of course, too much of something is is never good. So also too much mobility is not a good thing. Uh, but whether that leads to standardization and people becoming becoming the same, uh, there of course I would have to I would have to question that. And I, I'm thinking back on 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 the 1990s when there was uh, this burgeoning literature of globalization, and uh, particularly there also there was this huge worry that uh, with uh, all kind of processes becoming global that this would actually uh, make the world become very similar and all standard and it would all be the same. And so there were all these predictions, what would be the outcome of that? But what we see in, in practice, and this is still an ongoing thing, that whenever there are these pro uh, processes and whenever people feel or, or are uh, afraid that this may happen, then there is a severe backlash and, and people are reacting and people are uh, even reinforcing differences that may have existed or maybe inventing new ones to actually stress that they are different. Uh, and this is, this is what you clearly see going on uh, also now and also at the European level. From, 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 the, moment, uh, from the moment people feel, feel this is coming and, and, and whether this is real or, or imagined, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. People will actually react to this and one of the things I have been thinking about as, as a way to explain it is that um, when we are talking about processes of, of uh, standardization, we are also talking about making things bigger. So groups of people or uh, uh, places becoming bigger. I mean, uh, globalization is, of course, the maximum then uh, processes that are all around the globe. And this scale is something that uh, our, our brain is is not evolved to. I mean, our brain is not made to, to be thinking and, and to be considering things at the global scale. So this scale is just too big. In the end, uh, we are animals, uh, whether we like it or not, and we are social animals. And our our social group cannot be the world uh, because we our brain cannot process this. And this makes it also in increasingly difficult to, to be addressing the challenges of this planet, because a lot of the channels, challenges of this planet are global, and a lot of the solutions are global. It's not, it's not to be solved at the individual, let stand local or regional or national level. It needs to be uh, handled at the global level. But this is, uh, this is a scale that uh, people cannot handle. It's just too big. Uh, and think think about climate change. It's it seems all so abstract. People cannot deal with these scales that are so far removed from from what they experience. Of course, when the effects of climate change are becoming very real in the personal lives of people, yeah, then then people are uh, uh, maybe reacting. But then then it's maybe too late already. <laughs> let let me now ask you about the the issue of being of 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 belonging um, because according to, to some some philosophers and sociologists anthropologists we live in a in a world that that we are in a way not just uh moving fast but but we are not not more accelerated but but we live in a world desynchronized so so we we go from weekend to weekend and then the summertime, and then we end our period of work and we get retired. So, so our life is kind of uh, simplified in terms of milestones. We, we, we don't have the rituals, the ritualized life, but still you can see in, in Bhutan, you go there, you know, the, the community matters a lot and, and not much the individual. And they have com rituals that, that, that is make strong the the community and your feeling of belonging to this community, being part of this community. And then at the end, you, you have a, a, a way to explain yourself. So you have a narrative of your life. And according to, to many, some philosophers and sociologists, we live in a, in a world that is not just accelerated, it is dis, disynchronized. So we, we, we have problems to explain 
what we are doing, the meaning of our lives. And, and this is because we, we, we not only go fast, but we, we go uh, without, without much order, a following our order we don't understand. And this is, this is mostly because of, 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 of communication, excessive communication, excessive movement, excessive uh, wish to, to, to be efficient and to, and to do too many things and to transform even ourselves and, and not to be able to recognize the, the limits of everything. What, what, what is your understanding of this position? Yes, I think I think this is this is a right assessment, and uh, trying to explain what this is all about is a bit trickier. Uh, and when you're talking about uh, a lack of synchronization, uh, we are again back to to an idea of of pace and pace of life, and and this feeling feeling that something something is wrong, uh, something is wrong. And I think that a lot of what is wrong is, is an outcome of this uh, modern idea that uh, this creation of the human, uh, uh, think of uh, the Renaissance and uh, really a creation of the human as something something different from uh, nature and, and the concepts that we have actually uh, developed when we are talking about environment, is uh, environment something that is around us uh, not realizing that uh, we are part of the environment. So environment is actually a wrong term, but it's, it's the outcome, of course, of uh, thinking processes uh, that see the human as something different. And it's very interesting then as an anthropologist to be looking at a lot of uh, cultures around the world, uh, particularly indigenous cultures, where they have a very, very different worldview. Uh, where the human is not uh, different and where there's a much stronger uh, realization and an acknowledgement that we are part of something that is that is actually much bigger and there's more and more research uh, interdisciplinary research that actually shows this uh, this uh, within anthropology there is what what we call multi-species uh, anthropology or ethnography where it's about doing research uh, on the relation between humans and other species. Uh, and this is, of course, very tricky methodologically because how, how do you do this? Uh, it's, also, it's also drawing on uh, a lot of research within biology that actually shows uh, this idea that we have and that we take from, from, from Darwin that nature is in competition and that it's... Uh, animal against animal, species against species, and it's the survival of the fittest. What you actually see that in a lot of uh, processes on this planet, it's not about uh, competition, which is of course also very capitalist idea and neoliberal idea. Uh, it's not about competition, it's about collaboration. And nature only thrives uh, when it collaborates. And so you see a lot of fantastic examples, uh, and maybe one of the most fantastic examples is this: these networks of uh, trees and fungi. Uh, there's a lot of research and a lot of preoccupation around the world now for for uh, trees that are being uh, cut, and and you know, and, and how bad this is, and and uh, people have the sense of uh, uh, needing trees, uh, but uh, and of course it's easy to react towards the disappearance of trees because trees are something that we see. The fungi and their uh, underground networks is something that we don't see. And so we, we also don't realize the consequences of that. But trees can actually only thrive uh, because of these uh, fungi networks, underground networks that connect them and actually transport, transport things. And these are very mobile networks. I mean, talking about mobility, I mean, the whole of nature, of course, is actually about, about mobility. And so uh, this is now being uh, discovered in Western science, but a lot of this knowledge has been around for ages in actually other cultures. And so it's, it's very interesting how, how, how our Western science paradigm is, is actually catching up, uh, maybe a bit late, but it's catching up with a lot of insights that have been around. And it's very interesting to see how scientifically now it's being corroborated what other people have been knowing and have been sharing 
to uh, stories, to myths, to, to all kinds of ways of sharing, sharing knowledge. Uh, and it's, I think uh, this is also what people express through actually uh, wanting to, to reconnect uh, this idea that's feeling, uh, you, you say, desynchronized, but it's also feeling disconnected. It's feeling disconnected. And this is, of course, very ironic in an age where we have incredible transport networks, incredible communication networks. And this is the age where people feel most disconnected possible. Uh, and this is, of course, uh, disconnected from nature, from, uh, but also disconnected from other people. Uh, the, the amount of loneliness that people have who are constantly in contact with other people, but they still feel extremely lonely. Uh, this uh, losing the capacity to, to contact other people. Uh, I mean, this is, these are very serious problems. And it's, uh, uh, so many people attempt to yet yeah, to reconnect, but but many people have lost the tools to actually do so, either socially also to I mean how do we establish this reconnection with nature? There's all kind of naive ideas to do this, uh, and there's all kind of uh, things that are imported from other cultures. Think about uh, a lot of uh, people in Europe are now importing Japanese ideas of uh, the forest hugging uh, going in, in in the forest and establishing this physical contact with trees i mean there's all these ideas that are being imported but uh, it's to a certain extent very dramatic because it's uh, realizing that we have lost a lot of skills that uh, we must once have had or the human must once have had to actually connect and and that this is uh, lost or in the process of being lost mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. let's let's move to the to the idea of mobility and justice, as, as, as we, we tend to understand today. Uh, you, you have uh, emphasized that the injustice is mostly related to the lack of choice. So, so mobility justice is related to, to, to giving, giving people the choice to move or not to move or when to move. You, before you said that, that sometimes not moving or moving is lonely, uh, is a luxury. So it's a matter of quality as well. Quality of life sometimes is related to moving, to move slowly or just to stay in a given place. I, I would like you to, to, to further uh, elaborate on that. Having to, I have two samples of, of, of these in mind, which, is, which maybe are paradoxical in a way. One was the injustice in the, in the US, in the, in the beginning of the 20th century with black populations in Southern states when they were using public transport. So they, 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 they don't have the right to have a seat or they had to uh, give the seat to a white person that bought the bus afterwards or whatever. Uh, when these people were able to buy a car and they were able to drive wherever they wanted with their own car, you know, they, they had the, the the I think the feeling of uh, becoming, as you say, some somebody else. So having the not, not like the community they were living, uh, look at them, but but just because they were able to move, because they they were able to buy a car, they they had this feeling of freedom of becoming, uh, having the opportunity to become somebody different, or, or the the situation of women in in Saudi Arabia, they don't have the right. To drive a car, I think. So for 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 these women, is the system is really not just. It's not just for them because it's it's a way of of being sure that they remain the same. So they don't go they don't go where 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 uh, the husband or the father uh, don't know. So they have to stay. They have to they have as you say they have to to be what they are, but they have they belong. To the to the father <laughs> to the husband in a way so so could you could you please explain a little bit more all these all these uh, justices and injustices of mobility related to to your 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 i think your really clever concept of of being uh, belonging um becoming yeah, one of the things that I have written about and have reacted against is, of course, the ideology that is behind a lot of mobility thinking. 
and that is to to see mobility as actually the norm and the freedom and so that the problem is that uh, mobility is not accessible to everyone so basically seeing mobility as the norm and of course there is a lot of uh, there are a lot of inequalities related to access to uh, forms of mobility uh, this is undeniably so but i also want to stress that uh, it's not that all the people want to be mobile or want to be mobile all the time a lot of mobilities are mobilities also out of necessity but people don't necessarily want them i mean think about migration if people in in the places where they are would be uh, living in good conditions they would probably not want to migrate the reason why people want to migrate is is of course because they are hoping that the places that they are migrating to will help with will will allow them to live better lives or or establish better lives for, for, for their children so so and and then migration is an outcome of that uh and so so this is the reason why i have reacted towards this idea that uh the freedom is mobility and i'm stressing always that uh, the freedom is not mobility the freedom is actually the choice that people have whether they want to be mobile or not at certain points uh, and and it's basically that so the people who have most control of when they want to move and how they want to move i mean that's where the real freedom lies uh, and many people don't don't have that uh, but of course then going back to when people uh, make the decisions to be mobile there's of course there's plenty of inequalities and as as soon as you move you are confronted with inequalities and and again so these inequalities are related to your position in this world and your position is influenced by all this parameters that I mentioned before. It's linked to your social class, your, your nationality, your religion, uh, your, your gender, your, uh, I mean, all these parameters uh, have an influence. And this, this, of course, becomes very clear when you move uh, country uh, borders and, and when you need, you know, this documentation, uh, passports. I mean, passports are, of course, an, an, an element of discrimination. Uh, and it's it's not it's not passport it's of course categories because when we're talking about moving uh, moving people we divide them up in categories uh, and these labels are not neutral labels uh, think about the eu discourse uh, eu has has a discourse where they talk about migration and migration in the eu discourse is actually reserved to people from outside of the eu who actually move to the inside. Mobility in the EU discourse is actually about exactly the same movements, but it's EU citizens who are migrating to from one EU country to another EU country, uh, and that's then called mobility. And of course, these labels are not neutral because a migrant in this day and age has a very negative connotation. Nobody wants to be called a migrant, uh, but a person, a mobile EU citizen, and that sounds already uh something quite quite different and so there's also a lot of violence and injustice in the kind of labels that we are using and so in my writings also i want to make people aware of uh how we label things and how we name things is not a neutral thing again uh this has also co connotations and it it's 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 it enhances this injustices uh that are actually all around us and so so these labels are things that we should be very uh very much pre preoccupied with uh and and with these labels uh come 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 privileges because uh, i mean think of passports and visas uh, so a migrant visa comes with certain things a tourist visa comes with certain things i mean there's a reason why many migrants enter countries on tourist visa because with a tourist visa you know it's uh, there's less restrictions uh, and so there's, of course, there's this playing, playing around uh, with with labels, and and uh, and there's there's very interesting research when people are also people who are labeled in a certain way when they are all asked about you know what what they would uh, like to be called, and of course the answer is that nobody wants to be labeled. Uh, we all want to be treated as individual people, you know, uh, with our own agendas of 
uh, becoming, you know, and our own our own life projects. And, and the labeling is, of course, always very limiting, and it's to a certain extent grouping people uh, and, and and not 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 becoming aware of the fact that there are also many differences within those groups. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let me go back. Let me go back to the first question. <laughs> Maybe the order is, but this is kind of a spontaneous thing, you know, it's just, I'm just uh, making questions based on your answers. And, and I, 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 I had in mind now that when, when we discuss about the change in the culture of mobility, the changes, I ask you if we are witnessing uh, meaningful changes and, and you explain as the active mobility as one, one, one clue. To understand maybe what's happening new right now, um, let's let's be a little bit deeper on that. In 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 making clear the difference between changes in the behavior, like active mobility could be, and changes in the values. So our understanding on our, our perception that what's right, what's wrong. So do you think that in in this world, let's say we're Transport and technology is, is transport technology energy is moving so fast, and, and technology is changing continuously, and and we are in a in the middle of a exponential uh, revolution in terms of technology. Our behaviors may also change quicker than before. Maybe we can influence the behaviors. Maybe we are forced to change the behavior, whatever. But values remain the same. Or, or do you think opposite way? That, that we are forced to have the same behavior, let's say, we are forced to take the car every day because we live in the suburb and we have to go to the city center, but our values are changing and, and we feel bad because we are you know, driving a car in the middle of the city. So there is a lot of, you know, dissonance, cognitive dissonance, <laughs> because we are doing things that we should not be doing because our values and our behaviors are not uh, changing uh, in parallel, but, but, but uh, you know, in a disorganized way. Yeah, this is, uh, this is a difficult one to, to, to answer. Of course, we have, we have uh, a lot of technologies at our disposal and technologies are tools. Uh, they should never become uh, the, the, the end goal. They are tools and they help us with certain, with certain things like you have transport technologies, communication technologies, they help us. And so, so, so what you basically see that in a lot of the fields that are very important in our lives, there have been incredible technological developments. These, these uh, developments are really happening very quickly. I mean, if you look at this in a historical scale and you see how much technology has changed our lives in just the last hundred years and compare that to uh, 10,000 years ago, there were also technological developments, but they happened at a much slower pace. And so these technologies are, are, are happening in a very, very quick pace. And so again, we are limited because we are animals. We have a body, we have and a brain as part of the body. And so our brain is, uh, is not able to adapt so quickly to these technological changes. Uh, our brain is, is much slower. It, it would take much longer to actually adapt. And that's why also there is this, this, this discordance between what is possible on the technological level and how we can cope with this. Uh, on, on the one hand, uh, as a human based on, on, on our constitution, on how, on how we are built, on how our, our body is built, but together with, with how the body is built is, of course, there's an other element. And this is the fact that we are social animals. And so we are part of groups of people. And groups of people develop what in the, in the history we have called societies or cultures. And so these, people, these groups share uh, groups of values. Uh, and when we talk about values in the, in, the, in the ethical sense of, you know, what is good, what is proper, what is desirable, you know, what what is needed for actually having a good functioning uh, society. Values, uh, like many things that people create, uh, 
in a social or cultural way, change uh, on a slower pace. Values don't change quickly. They take time to change because uh, humans are innately, and, and this is a typical thing, are innately uh, resistant to change. Why? Because change may bring you to a situation that you don't know. And if you have to choose between, uh, between a situation that you know and don't know, people tend to go to stick to the situation that they know, even if it's not necessarily a, a, a good one, because the, 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 the one of opting for the change is opting for not knowing what the outcome will be. And so there's risk involved and people try to minimize risk. And so uh, because of that behavior, it's very hard to impose change. Uh, and this is, of course, where it becomes tricky because a lot of technology that we are implementing and we want to introduce is, is of course, uh, to a certain extent, imposing changes to people because uh, the people that have invented technologies are not experts in, in actually assessing what, how people will react to this or, you know, all these all this elements that I have just been mentioning. And so... Uh, this, of course, points when we are talking about a about, uh, future uh, is, is that you need to work much more interdisciplinary. You know, you need to, in, there's so many aspects that you need to take into account when you are, uh, when you want to introduce change. And we, we see that very clearly now. Uh, we are experiencing a, a, a strange period where some, some things are imposed on people. And you see how, how, how this is backfiring now, how there's protests and things, and because people don't, don't like change. Uh, but at the same time also, and this, is, uh, this was very interesting at the beginning of the, the coronavirus crisis, a lot of people were very hopeful because it is true that periods of crisis uh, are actually uh, accelerators of change because uh, this is not normal. And people, uh, people are, are very much willing then to uh, uh, undertake risk in a crisis situation, much more than in the situation where there is, where there is no crisis. And you can see that when, you, I mean, this historical analysis of, of people in, in war periods and, you know, where, where it's, you, you have much more leeway as a society to actually change things. Uh, but then you need to be on the ball and you need to know how, how to do that. And, and, and that requires uh, yeah, that requires quite some uh, uh, collaborative research. I'm thinking of, of the, uh, the period you were mentioning before the US history. I was thinking about the US and uh, during the Second World War, where basically, uh, so at that time, people already had uh, lots of cars in the US and car, the car was a symbol of freedom. And it was very important for people to have cars. And so these cars needed fuel. And so during the Second World War, actually, uh, uh, the government needed a lot of resources uh, and, and a lot of fuel and things like that for, for the war machinery. And so they needed, they needed to, to find uh, ways to motivate people, you know, uh, use your car less and, and so, so that we can have more fuel to use for, for, for the whole war uh, machine. And this, this, I don't have time to go uh, over this now, but it's very interesting historical research that that uh, analyzes these these campaigns. You know how how as a government, you know what kind of tools do you use to to motivate your people to actually give up some of their uh, privileges and some of their uh, the things that they really value as important. Uh, and of course, in a in a situation of crisis, this is easily easier done than in a situation where people don't perceive crisis. Mm -hmm. Great, Noel, we are just about, unfortunately, but I cannot be so selfish to ask you only my own question. So I, I'm going to take one question from uh, the friends and colleagues which are writing uh, a number of questions on this one I have to take. I have to go closer to the screen because I cannot read otherwise. And this question is going to be a surprise for myself. Mm -hmm. So let's, let me see. It's a long question by Matteo Turroa, a friend of us. We, we are reviewing the traditional use of the value of travel time. He's saying, the point I would like to argue is that the time has an intrinsic value, probably related to life expectancy, and the value we give to it comes on top or below of it in terms of the utility or disutility 
of what we do with the time. So time is, has an intrinsic value, regardless the usefulness of it for us. We, we may do thus related value of life and the value of time, but we should, so, so in a way it's not just a matter of quality, also it's a matter of quantity, but we should be able to give a value to the utility of the travel time if we use this time to work, to enjoy the travel, or, or we are suffering from uncomfortable conditions, then we, we can value travel time properly. This is complicated, but probably the only way to include slow mobility in the evaluation models. Would, would you agree in this line of thought? I think Mateo is trying to see how we can integrate meaning into the useful value of time. And, and this is going to, to, to difficult philosophical questions because in a way he's saying that there is an intrinsic value, kind of an essence of time, which is somehow to be integrated into the existence value of time. So it's kind of complicated questions at the end. No, but, but I understand what he is saying and, and, and it makes quite, it makes quite a lot of sense to me. I mean, uh, people, people are very much aware of the fact that uh, our life is, is limited in time. And so that means that what we do with the time, of course, the more, the more time we can spend on doing things that we value, the better we will experience the quality of our life. And so if you apply that to, to transport and the fact that people have to work and so they have to spend time to actually also get to, to their work. You know, if you talk about this, this daily movements back and forth to work, just to, to take one example, if that time spent in that transport is, is not experienced as, as valuable, then it's very frustrating. And it's even more frustrating if you are in your car and you are in, in this huge traffic jam, you know, then, and, and so people try to, my, try to make this meaningful. And so, of course, in the traffic jam, people try to make this meaningful, but then uh, reading the newspaper or checking things on their phone or, you know, they, they always try to add uh, meaning to it. And so other people now are, are trying to actually uh, to do this, this transport uh, to their work to actually uh, move it into, into a more active form of movement, like cycling to work. And now with e-bikes, of course, people can do this for longer distances as a way also to make uh, this time more meaningful and i think this is of course this can be done in 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 many ways but i think this is of course important that uh transport is not just seen as let's make it as comfortable as possible or whatever no it it also should be meaningful people if people uh, find it meaningful of course then they will then they will also be willing to to actually accept it much better and, and maybe also be more open to to actually do this for for longer times uh, spend more time in, in traffic because what they're doing is, is actually meaningful. Yeah. 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 Uh, interesting. Let me ask you the last question. The last question. Um, how a better understanding of mobility cultures may provide for a more human sensitive political decisions? And the last question was very, 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 <laughs> I think, interesting. As a, as a reference for my last question, because we know for sure that better understanding of mobility cultures will provide for a more sensitive political decision. That's obvious, but how? So it seems that still political decisions are too much embedded into kind of orthodox economic understanding of utility, too much technocratic, it seems that one thing is what we feel, the other thing is what we approve. It seems that at the level of rhetorics, maybe we are sensitive to new mobility cultures, but in the actual uh, things we do, we remain too much with the previous inertias. Do, do you see that, that there is a kind of gap in between what we think, what we feel, what we are talking, and then the, the, the policies we see applied, implemented in practice? Well, I think what is important to to realize, and it's maybe going back to this example that I gave about nature, and we are part of nature, that the way nature works is that nature 
survives and is very flexible because it, it, it has developed systems of collaboration. There's this very intricate and very old systems of uh, species and parts of nature that are collaborating. Well, now when it, when it comes to, to policies, uh, be it mobility policies or other policies, it should be exactly the same. And it's always realizing that uh, issues are complex and should be related and should always be seen in relation to other things. And so that also means when you are talking about uh, transport policy, uh, policies or mobility policies, be it in an urban context or on a larger scale, also these uh, problems or issues cannot be seen separate. And so if you, if you only have transport people to solve transport issues, uh, that will not solve the issue because transport issues are related to other issues. And, and in an urban context, mobility issues are related to, to other issues. And so you always need, uh, you need to have this interdisciplinary approaches and you always need to have a very healthy balance between experts, people who really know a lot about a very small but specific area and then generalists, people who are able to, to see in a, in a more holistic way how these different experts islands are actually connected and, and how, how they influence one another. And so that means that effective policy making uh, takes more time, but in the, in the long run, of course, will be much more sustainable. I mean, if you go for the, the quick and efficient, then, then maybe it will work, but it will not be very sustainable. If you want to work towards issues and, and, and policies that are sustainable, it requires more work because you have to involve more parties and you have to listen more and you have to uh, try to uh, make this uh, puzzle, this complex puzzle, you know, to see how these different uh, pieces fit. And so, so it's, it's a lot about collaboration. And so this is something that we all have to learn more. We, we have, many of us are, are trained to be experts uh, because the expert model is, is, is what is being valued. And expertise is, is, is definitely needed in this world. Uh, but we need also uh, people who connect these different expertises in, in, into, the, into the puzzle. And so there's not only the, the pieces of the puzzle, but there's also the glue, the glue that connects you know, these different pieces of the puzzle, puzzle and that then makes sure that once the puzzle is made, that it stays made you know, and that it doesn't uh, disintegrate. Thank you, Noel. Well, first, I apologize for all friends and colleagues which are uh, that were listening to us. I, I, I was unable to take all so many questions that we had uh, for this talk. But um, I hope all, all of you, you enjoy that much as myself, the talk with Noel and learn a lot, but mostly we enjoy a lot. So it was a great uh, hour. So thank you very much, Noel, for, for your time with us, for your ideas, and please keep writing. You know, I waiting uh, answers from your last book, Momentous Mobility, I bought weeks ago. And, you know, I don't have the book and, and, and it's hard for me to, you know, uh, to, to wait. So in a way, I'm, uh, uh, this is low movement in, in relation to my wish to have your book is not working for me. <laughs> Thank you very much for your time, Noel. Thank you very much. And I hope this is uh, useful. And I wish you all the best with, with the rest of your project. Thank you very much, Noel. Bye. Bye-bye. in contact. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.